so welcome everybody uh, to today's edition of uh, our online seminar series on emerging topics in biomolecular magnetic resonance. Um, so uh, as stated here, we aim to present frontier research in magnetic resonance in biological systems. Uh, please do not record uh, because the lectures, actually uh, both lectures today will be recorded and made available at the ICMRBS uh, YouTube channel where you can already find now most of uh, previous uh, lectures. Um, and uh, just a reminder, so don't use the chat uh, button for asking questions, but the Q&A. Uh, alternatively, you might also raise your hands uh, and then we can unmute you and you can directly uh, ask the questions yourself. So then uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome uh, today's speakers. Uh, Katja Petzold uh, will be going first. Uh, so Katja is now an associate professor and also a Ragnar Söderberg fellow in medicine at the Department of Medical Biochemistry and Biophysics. Um, so Katja uh, actually received her university training in Göttingen at the Martin Luther uh, University in Halle and uh, studied their biochemistry and biotechnology. But then already in 2005, uh, she moved to Sweden. And apparently Sweden is so nice uh, that she kind of uh, hang on there. Uh, first for a PhD in medical biophysics with uh, Professor Schleucher at the Umea University. Uh, and then uh, she had a short leave from Sweden, uh, visiting or working actually for Hashima Hashimi at the University of Michigan in Narva as a postdoctoral fellow. And I guess that's where she fell in love with uh, protein, or not protein dynamics, uh, molecular dynamics, uh, and uh, in this case, nucleic acids. And uh, I guess uh, her work has shown over the years, both in Hashim's lab uh, and also now her own uh, work, which we'll hear today about how important it is uh, to study uh, molecular dynamics by NMR spectroscopy in order to understand biological function. So uh, thank you uh, very much for agreeing to speak today, Katja, and the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Markus, and uh, your organizers. Um, this is a really amazing series, and I'm super happy that I can uh, show uh, work from my lab today. Yeah. <laughs> In these times, uh, it's great that we can come together as a community and discuss work in alternative ways. Okay, so this is the main work of one of my students, uh, Lorenzo Baronti, and we talk about microRNA dynamics, and I hope I don't have a power outage anytime soon because we have flashes a lot behind me. Um, so I actually start this time with the acknowledgement. So Lorenzo Baronti is my first PhD student and he has pulled up in his PhD what uh, very few otherwise can do, actually publishing the story he started to do in nature at the end, which I think he can be really, really proud of. And also other people who have been from my lab, uh, I say contributing, Judith, Emily, Eliana, Zara, and also from our collaborators from the Ellen Chan lab uh, and uh, Bastian from Parisa um, to get it there. And then other people in the lab which have contributed on other projects. You will see very short overview at the very end. So to come that, um, we're also actually looking for a postdoc uh, in NMR development. So if you think what we're doing is interested, uh, inter interesting and you want to join doing some more NMR, uh, send me an email. Um, and as Markus just pointed out, um, we have, uh, we don't work with proteins, but with RNA. So I thought I'd point out why should we study RNA and what is RNA and how does it look like? So on the left-hand side, we have a tRNA. Do you see my cursor? And on the right side, we have the ribosome, straps of all the proteins, but actually the core function of the ribosome is done by RNA. Um, and also just very recent, Actually, Moderna and BioNTech as two out of the four current mRNA uh, vaccines, which are in, in phase three clinical trials, are mRNA vaccines, which is very new. So study RNA, it's the future of medicine. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, um, overall, as uh, Marco said, we study dynamics on molecules. Um, here I have just shortly depicted of what type of timescale we can observe using NMR. For example, real-time NMR, RDCs, uh, up to 10 to minus 12 seconds and up to 270 hours, or if you want to measure so long. 
Um, and then we can observe different type of, of things. We can observe overall large global changes of proteins and unlocated assets, or we can observe very fast switches in secondary structure, for example, alternative base pairing here. Our main methodology is uh, something called R1 row, and I will explain this a bit more in detail. Um, here you see uh, secondary structures of um, an RNA molecule, and below you see an arrow indicating the coherence. And you say that once the structure changes, the coherence is out of phase, and that's what we can monitor using uh, the magnetic field of the NMR. So if we don't have a change of coherence, so no uh, dynamics, we have a flat dependency of an applied radio pulse which very, very in power. However, if we have a change and the loss of coherence, we can see a dependency of the applied field and we can extract information about this equilibrium between the most observed something called the ground state and a state of higher energy we call excited state. And what we can observe is, for example, the exchange rate in this equilibrium, the populations of those two states, and most importantly, actually, the chemical shift. And indicated here is you, that you usually observe the lowest energy state. The chemical shift is directly observable. However, sometimes uh, you can observe the excited state or the high energy state at low population, but often it is not observable at all, only indirectly with our own observable. So in uh, 19, uh, 2009, Alex Hansen and, uh, and the Alashimi lab actually uh, set up an experiment for nucleic acid to measure carbon relaxation, and I indicated here on the, uh, ba in the base and the sugar, which carbons you can measure. And we use this experiment to do really the first studies uh, to un understand structure. And how do we do this? So you see this on resonance curve before. That means basically our carrier is exactly on resonance on the signal here in a 2D or in a 1D. And then we do something we call off resonance and we sweep with our carrier, both right and left, but I indicate the only one. And then we see the contribution of the exchange parameters, so the REX contribution, the relaxation contribution, uh, increases to a maximum exactly at the point where we are on resonance with the excited state. That means we can actually directly read out the chemical shift of the excited state at this maximum. We can also fit it, for example, to a Laguerre approximation uh, uh, previously formulated by Palmer. And, uh, and then when we have this chemical shift information, this is really important chemical shift information because we can actually derive a structure from. Nucleic acids are actually pretty beautiful because they are very easy to structural interpret. It. So here I've indicated everything in green is uh, indicative of a helical structure, so something which is very straight. Um, and then we have here in, 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 uh, in orange and yellow, something which is non-helical. So something which is a, has a missing a base pairing partner or is a mismatch or has a really odd structure as in a loop or bulge. And you, you can see that, for example, for GC8s, there's a very clear distinction between here and here. So the chemical shifts, uh, here, this is basically the average and one standard deviation of all chemical shifts from the BMRB queried and overlaid on the HSQC. So using the chemical shift information we have from our ground state and going to excited state, we can say, okay, it goes, for example, from a um, less helical state to a more helical state. So we have done this, or I have done this on one sample system, which is the um, um, HIV RNA uh, dimerization initiation site. Uh, indicated here as a, as a picture. So this is two HIV genomes which come together in order to form a virion. Uh, only once this dimerization happens of the two genomes, the uh, uh, packing is initiated because uh, a virion with just a single genome is almost non-effective. It's about 1% uh, the same effectivity of a double genome virion. So this is actually very important. And uh, here's a zoom in of this dimerization initiation site and there is a conserved bulge and it was not known what the function of this bulge is. Um, however, it was known that it is dynamic, but not much more than that. So we measured relaxation dispersion. So look, the experimental curve curves, they are not necessarily always beautiful. And here we have again our chemical shift indicators. And then basically we have measured the chemical shifts of all the bases and the sugars. And I indicated here what bases in the bulge want to become. They want to become more helical. So they want to be in a structure which is more helical and everything around it wants to become less helical. So how do we figure out what type of structure that is? Well, we can go back to actually something people working with nucleic acid all the time, we predict the structure. And this is usually the lowest energy structure predicted. The first one you see here, there's two Gs and the A is in a mismatch. That's exactly what we have in our ground set that we observe by NMR. And then we see numerous other structures. And then we can see, okay, this wants to be, become less helical. So which of those other structures does fulfill this? So here we have the AG being in a bulge. This is exactly what we would actually observe here. 
So we can simply by choosing one of the other predicted structures um, see that this would agree. So basically what happens is that those three bases, they will leave their base pairing partners and zip down like a zipper. And then we have a bulge here. And that actually works pretty well for this part here. And here the chemical shifts are green now. Green is now in a helix and yellow is in a bulge. We have a population of 9%. So the state is about a tenth almost of all molecules populated and has a lifetime of about 100 to 120 microseconds. But you see there's still discrepancy here in the bottom. And it turns out we don't only see a single state, but we actually see two states, a second state with a lower population, where the zipper instead of going up, it goes down. So now chemical shifts are indirect, and this is also just a prediction, prediction chosen by chemical shifts. We need to prove that those chemical shifts are actually correct, and these structures would look like this. How do we do that? We do something we call the mutate and chemical shift fingerprint, fingerprint approach. So it's a mouthful, MCSF for short. So here we have our uh, equilibrium. And I have chosen now two uh, parameters to present. So A25, which is then in the bulge, and G31, which is in the bulge in this state here. Um, if now we actually mutate, so we can plot here the chemical shift we see from our row, and we can try now to stabilize the mutation or adding small molecules or modifications. In this case, we change G to a C, and that becomes what's a big base pair before it was a GG mismatch. And that is enough to actually stabilize this. And by NMR, we confirmed that this is now the most stable structure and we compare this chemical shift. And this goes in the same direction, indicating that this becomes now more bulge-like. We can do the same for the other structure. Here we mutate the G, double G here to a U on the C and have what's the big base case here. And have again, this as the most stable structure and compare the chemical shifts. Interestingly, we also see that, for example, A25 here in this structure is very base-like. This is also very similar to the ground state strip. So this is also a double background. And we can do this by mutation, but we can also add, for example, small molecules. In this case, we know that magnesium inhibits the dimerization um, in large concentration, also reduces the, the dynamics of the system. And we see the chemical shifts added when we add magnesium look very much like ground state, like so being in a helix. So using this approach, we could confirm that those are really actually states in their structure, they do exist. But what is actually the biological function of those zippers up and down? Well, we're coming back that actually the HIV genome needs to dimerize. So we have a homodimer, which comes together with a kissing complex here. And this kissing complex now has those two strands which need to be exchanged. And here I've indicated the zipper going up and down in the single monomer. But this zipper can also actually do this on the homodimer at a strand and then basically exchange two base pairs at a time and therefore have a type of double strand invasion to exchange the strands via a low energy bridge. You don't have to melt the whole genome in order to dimerize. You can do it two paste tests at a time. So this is a hypothesis we have not yet been able to prove, but it's very feasible. Good, um, so this was basically the first experiment we had and we were able to measure a number of different um, RNA excited states, one of them presented here. Uh, a few years later, during my postdoc time, uh, Evgeny Nikolova, also in Hashim's lab, um, actually worked instead of carbon on nitrogen. And I show here the basis you can actually measure in, in, in RNA. And uh, this allowed us then to actually study something else. And usually we go on a hunch, we measure something, and then we say like, okay, we have a chemical shift, and we have no clue what it is. In this case, we really had to actually do a lot of uh, calculations because this is not a structural change, but rather a chemical shift. A chemical change from a cater to a null tautomer. So basically what happens is that we have an amino and this proton moves from this amino over to the uh, cater group before a, a null step. And so this we could observe using nitrogen uh, chemical shifts and nitrogen dispersion. However, doing this, we still have a lot of um, reporter atoms like here carbon C8 uh, or GC8 as well which sometimes you see that there is dispersion, but you cannot interpret it because it's either too fast or too small contribution. And nitrogen is often not a really good probe in, in nucleic acid because it is often either not accessible because there's no proton no close by or it's next to exchangeable protons. So it's very, very few um, probes. We wanted to have more probes and new probes which can access these timelines too. Um, so what we work with is something called proton relaxation. Um, Judith and Emily in my lab have first actually worked on the labeled variant, which was published in 2016. And then Hampus in my lab said, well, if we work with protons, why do we need actually carbon labels? Because usually 
that's what we do. We use carbon, nitrogen, fully labeled RNAs. And we say like, yeah, but you know, it's all this over, over, overlap and everything, everything is full and so on. But you did, and, and Emily made it work. So here's a, just the a 1D part where she um, uh, selectively excited aromatic protons, so the protons here in the base, and then um, spin locked them. And then using the coupling, actually transferred them and then basically emptying the, the area. So we have now both in the H8 area and the H6, H5 area, we have now single um, peaks which we can analyze. And you can even run this as a 2D and have even better um, dispersion. And so we can actually measure with this um, relaxation dispersion. And it turns out this is a super sensitive experiment. We can now observe even um, dispersion profiles of REX contribution of one hertz. Um, and basically populations of 0.3% uh, percent or minus uh, chemical shift changes of 0.2 ppm, which is really, really small. To actually demonstrate how small this is, um, we have compared the same, we have also measured the same experiment with CES. So this is a proton CES, and here is the excited state you would observe, and you see the dot, dots of noise. So we actually had to zoom in, this is 0.29 to 0.31 zoom in. So you would not be able at all to observe this using CES instead. But we were able to discover discover our photon number one. So now, okay, we have those nice experiments. What do we do with them? In my lab, when I set it up, we are interested in something called microRNA. So microRNAs are the ones which actually regulate mRNA by actually building, uh, forming a complex with the argonaut protein called the risk complex, and uh, they they bind to mRNA via a seed sequence and then either stall the ribosome from making new proteins or um, start up the adenylation, so the stable, destabilize the mRNA and it will be degraded. Um, it can also be uh, cutting the, the mRNA directly. This is called the RNAi pathway when you have perfect complementary between the microRNA and the mRNA. So all this would be what's in the base pairs, but then it's in, in, in RNAi, not in microRNA, in interference RNA. And microRNAs are uh, called microRNAs because they actually have uh, mismatches and, and non watson quick base pairs in this part here. So we were interested what the role of those mismatches and bulges are. And we used the example of microRNA 34A. It's a, a kind of a gatekeeper similar to P53. It's actually even influencing P53. So it's activated by P53 and it's inhibiting via sort one deacetylation uh, P53. Um, microRNA 34A also regulates a number of other proteins which are basically involved in, in almost every single cellular process. Um, and it's, I think, misregulated in more than 50% of the cancer. So it's an interesting microRNA to look at. So here in green, we see our microRNA, and in, in, uh, in uh, gray, our mRNA, and then orange is indicated the seed. So this is the part which is perfectly complementary. And you see already from predicting that there's dynamics, but we don't actually know what is the base structure, the, the observed structure, the ground structure. So we had to first establish this, and then we had to see, is there dynamics and what does it actually biologically mean? So here comes Lorenzo in the game. So he ex, uh, established that this is the, the ground state structure. This is the seed. And then we have uh, a decent amount of dynamics. And we showed example here of this G, the proton and nitrogen uh, relaxation dispersion, where we are able to extract that this G here in a GCC watson quick base pair wants to become rather something called a GU wobble. And we have indicated this chemical shifts we have extracted from the dynamics here in uh, 2D spectra, basically mining from the BMRB. So all GUs are indicated here as the average and standard deviation, and our excited state would fall in here. And all GC, what's in the base pairs, aminos actually would come here where our ground state is here. So this is, of course, our hypothesis. Now we have to mutate and chemical shift fingerprint again. Here's our ground state, and you see this is supposedly something called severmere. So um, this is very important for the activity later on. But you see this is closed by an AU base pair, which is a bit weak usually in, in, in liquid assets. And then our G is down, is down here, where we have a GC Watson weak base pair. So our excited state, this G wants to become a G wobble. So for example, a Ken base pair with U21. And when it do so, it also staples this AU closing base pair. And now we have a really strong seed here. When we now actually trap this state, we did actually exchange this U with this C. And then we have a GC state here, and we have the same state. But overall, the affinity of the microRNA and the mRNA has not changed because it is a, I say, conserve, conserving um, mutation. You see, we have a decent uh, agreement of chemical shifts of the excited state from R1Rho. 
as well as the one assigned later on by chemical shifts. There are some differences, which are largely due to where we have the mutation directly, for example, here on H22. So what is now the function of this dynamical state of the switching? That is actually, that's, that's, we, we, we had troubles to actually imagine that, and especially also because it's supposed to be within the risk complex. But together with Alan Chen, we have looked into also trying to understand and measure um, structures from, from limited NMR data, for example, just base pairing. So here, uh, this is something we call NMR-informed MD, where we just uh, inform the MD by what should be base paired in the lettered one. And we get an information, a structural bundle. And we see that this structural bundle, for example, has uh, two helical stems with an average of 146 uh, degrees. While the ground state from uh, the excited state from our one row, as well as the trapped excited state, actually have an angle here of about 90 degrees. And they agree very much, although we have not, I say, restrained them to each other. We're only given the base pairing information, the GU switching to the, the GC to the GU. So that was interesting, and we did not really know what this should mean until we actually put the microRNA in its uh, host protein, the argonaut, and forming the risk complex. So we took the crystal structure, take out the microRNA there, and aligned our microRNA in the seed because it is a very clear system. And then we see in red where our microRNA would go. And this is how it is known. It's anchored in the 5 permand on the mid-domain, and the 3 permand is on the parts domain. And as I said earlier, this seed here, this base pairing is quite weak. And uh, it is known that if the seed uh, is not very strong and the base pairing is here not a bit weak, the helix 7 will not move and will not allow, one second, will not allow for the rest of the complex to form. Where, however, when we actually now extend and form this longer seed with this extra base pair, we switch the helix, we move helix 7, so we can form the arrest. Additionally, the, the switch of this uh, GU also helps to realign this other helix and full, pulling the, the free prime end out of the parts domain along, aligning it along the end domain, which is, uh, uh, has been seen in prokaryotic eukaryotes, uh, um, argonauts, um, to be a more active complex. So is that actually how it is really in reality? Here we see basically a slope of structure, how this goes from itself. So we have here the wild type, and then we have something, uh, a fluorescence uh, assay, dual luciferase assay it's called. We can observe the downregulation efficiency of the wild type, which is about 50%. And then we actually trap our uh, excited state. We can also use this as a, as a biological readout. And we see that it's about double as strongly downregulating the mRNA than the wild type itself. So this was kind of interesting. And uh, so thanks to very demanding reviews, um, we actually uh, uh, looked from n equals one. That's usually, you know, structure biology. Doing one example is already really hard work, showing that this is more generally correct. That's even more problematic. So what we then thought, okay, if we can see this UG forming and other microRNA mRNA pairs, um, basically looking for a seed where you have a U single bulge and a GC closing base pair, we found those in several different uh, mRNA microRNA um, systems. We took those and then mutated them, and we saw a general down, stronger downregulation, often about two times fold, stronger than in the wild type, which uh, really indicates that this seems to be a more general uh, approach. However, when you look at the values, we actually observed only 1% uh, of uh, the excited state in vitro and about 99% uh, in, in vivo, which you would not expect if we have just about 50% improvement. This comes along with a question that those cells are actually measured in living cells. And we have no idea what the in vivo population is. The energy differences between those states is often just a few kcal per mole. So just a single hydrogen bond to change in pH can be different. So therefore, we're actually in our lab also interested to measure inside NMR, which we have just recently published a proof of concept. We are interested to linking global to global dynamics. Uh, using, for example, MD and SACS, so something we are just about to finish up. Uh, and we also look, for example, on ribosome dynamics. Uh, from structures and crystal structures, it's known that the, the ribosomes should move through different states, but the local dynamics are not actually understood. So we are studying these now. Uh, additionally, to these times, we are part of the COVID-19 NMR project, so where we elucidate RNA structures and hope to find new um, RNA drugs against them. And if you're seeing, like what you're seeing, you know, send me an email for a postdoc. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Katya, for this brilliant presentation. So uh, now that our session is open for uh, question and answers, so please type your uh, question into the Q&A box. Um, I, I might begin there. Uh, so uh, do you do these measurements also at the temperature, so at room temperature, where you do the cell experiments that one can compare these numbers or how much would the temperature affect the populations and the rates? That's a, it's a good question. Um, I'm oh, sorry. What? Did I, I just disappeared. My computer disappeared. Do you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, this is a good question. Um, so the, the cell experiments is human cells. So they are done at 37 degrees. The uh, dynamics in my cornea are done at 25 degrees. Um, our experience with uh, different, I say, dynamics of population state is that, um, the key exchange as the rate of the exchange back and forth. However, the population usually does not if the states are not melting, so to say, in this time frame. So therefore, we expect that the pure in vitro, uh, I say, dynamics at 37 would probably still be around one or two percent. It might be though double as fast. So KX is usually a factor of two by 10 degrees change. Mm -hmm. However, as I say, I think it is more interesting the the either different proteins, different concentrations of, of salts, protons in, in the cell might, might, might move this uh, equilibrium very easily, fast. And I've also have to say that, for example, the trapped state is not a non-dynamic state. It actually still accesses the ground state at certain percentage. Okay, thank you. So then uh, Christian also wanted to ask something, Christian? Yes, um, um, on slide 13, okay. can, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, on you. slide 13, you had um, um, uh, re relaxation dispersion of, um, of an A and, uh, or AC and GC, I believe. And, um, and the movie shows more or less that, they, that it goes somehow correlated, but the rates that you see there are very different. Oh, those are actually from different samples. Okay. <laughs> so those are just two examples we have in the lab, which we cannot identify the, I say, the chemical shifts because the exchange is too, um, the exchange contribution is too small. So you see okay. your R2 is, is somewhere here, for example, for the, the, the very small one is, is about 24 hertz. The contribution is about, of the RX okay. is about but, but, Okay, then, then yeah. if they are from different samples then, okay, that, that I didn't catch. Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Hmm. So then I would like to go to the Q and A's. Um, so I'll start somewhere now. Um, maybe I'll start with uh, Haribao Alcanari. Uh, so does the excited state I... remain at 1% when bound to Argonaut? This is a good question. Um, so we have been on a, on, a, on a story of failures and reading between lines in the Argonaut project. So we started originally with the KP Argo and now working with the human Argonaut protein. Um, it is interesting that I say the crystal structures of current uh, Argonaut are potentially only about 1% active. So they only have, yeah. We cannot at this point do a, an NMR experiment with human Argonaut in micro -unilabed in India. It's something we are aiming for, but uh, it is not feasible. So. We don't know if this will have the same uh, dynamics. So the crystal structures are often disordered in this area. So it could well be. But uh, at this point, it's not, it's not possible to know. I would assume, because of our biological data, that there are some dynamics because we do, when we switch and stabilize the excited state, we do see a difference. So something is going on, but we cannot guarantee it. Thank you. Uh, then an anonymous attendee asks, um, yeah, which probably every non-NMR person kind of <laughs> wonders and even NMR persons, how can you measure such low populations with high precision? What's the experimental error? So the experimental error is a quite complicated to uh, analyze, but overall, yes, we can measure up to 0.01% population, um, which, for example, for the Cato and Nolte automere, where we had a really, really, really large chemical shift change of about 30 to 50 ppm, then the experiment becomes very, very sensitive. It is an indirect measurement, but it is actually pretty accurate. Um, the errors are depending of, of the experimental quality and 
if we hit, so to say, the sweet, pot, sweet spot of the sensitivity of the experiment. So, for example, carbon relaxation, the sweet spot of our current experiment is about 1000 hertz exchange rate. Then you can measure populations of 0.1 ppm if you have a nice chemical shift change. So, there's a, a variability of several parameters which play into how good you can measure things. But you can also get a, an error of 10, 15 percent on something which has by itself a, a population of 10, 20 percent. Um, it really depends of, of how your state is. We know how we can manipulate some of the sweet spots, so changing temperatures, adding magnesium, stabilizing samples, for example, or measuring different um, atom types, like changing to nitrogen or protons. But we, we don't always manage to get, I say, really good errors. Sometimes it's more on the, on the larger error side, and then we do F-tests to make sure that we actually model this really well. So there's a, a massive, I say, analytical part behind it. Thank you. Uh, then Mandar Deshmukh uh, would like to know how could this dynamics affect the RNA initiation state where DISA recognizes the pre-miRNA? One would expect alterations in DISA activity as well between mismatch mRNA versus perfectly based paired uh, mI or SI RNA. Okay, so this is a, a complex question because it's mm. I'll ask about DICER recognition of pre microRNA, which is a different thing than the, um, the microRNA mRNA complex. Um, so the, the pre microRNA, I, there's also some mismatches involved, and yes, there, this can also lead to, I say, different, I say, loading, for example. And in the recognition, yeah, we don't really know. At this point, we only have actually evaluated this single structural element. Uh, several different microRNAs have different uh, mRNA structural properties, which we are just starting to look at. So, I said, yes, stay tuned. <laughs> okay, then, then maybe because we're an NMR uh, seminar series, there's a more NMR related question. So, uh, from Romeo Cosimo Arrigo Dobini. Uh, so, brilliant uh, presentation regarding the low power spin lock R1 row experiments. When I try to access spin lock powers lower than 1.5 kilohertz, I encounter severe artifacts depending on the chemical shift, even if they stay on resonance on a given signal. How did you manage measuring sub kilohertz profiles on protons? So first you have to have an unlabeled sample. Otherwise you have, of course, uh, the artifacts from the, the, the labeled carbons or nitrogens. So it only works on ooh, really loud thunder, um, on really on unlabeled samples, uh, as you see probably also on my slide here. Um, I can shortly share. I'm sorry. So here you see that for labeled uh, samples, so carbon nitrogen labeled, you cannot go lower than 1.2, 1.5 kilohertz. However, for unlabeled, you can go down to, I think we've tried to measure 25 hertz. Um, so then I'm not really sure if I understand the question, what type of uh, artifacts you observe. Uh, I would have to go in detail. We can have artifacts and we have also described in this eye, which is a, a mile long of this paper. Um, how, for example, to recognize artifacts from, for example, nosy transfers, because sometimes you can have uh, uh, the two spins uh, if you have a ground and excited state, but you also have your, your ground state in, in the same spin, with, which would have an NOE to it. So you would have transport there. So this can give artifacts. Um, but they are not always, uh, they, they can be severe, but they not always are super severe, depending on what system you have. Uh, it's much more problematic in protons, uh, proteins, because you have much higher proton density. In nucleic acid, the proton density is lower, so we have less NOEs largely. And the NOE chemical shift differences is often bigger. So the, the differences between one, one spin and the other spin is quite big, so you don't hit them immediately with your spin locks. So you can avoid some of those. Um, otherwise, I would have to look into details. Would like to know what the severe artifacts are. Okay, I think that was very, very good answer. Thank you. So then, Fred Denberger asks: uh, the low populations of the excited state indicates a significant energy difference. How does that compare to the expected free energy of binding the variant RNA versus the wild type to argonaut? Okay, so. Um, the, the energy difference is not so big. I, I don't remember now by heart. It's somewhere in two to four kilo uh, cal per mole. Um, however, when you look at the, the uh, um, 
So the 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 mutation is actually uh, oh now you actually I don't see the mutation is actually isosteric because you see here we we actually mutate the C to the U and the U to the C. So the mRNA microRNA binding is basically energetically exactly the same. We also have shown this with uh, binding assays. We call it's called filter binding assay, where we have the microRNA in argonaut on the filter binding to mRNAs. We've done this both for the ground state and for the trapped excited state, and they have the exact same affinity. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I think uh, maybe one more question or so. Uh, so, um, how does uh, Konstantin Miniev, I uh, would like to know, how does the NMR informed MD work? What are the restraints? Yeah, so uh, this is uh, actually in a, in, a, in a metals paper last year um, published uh, together with the Alan Chance lab. Um, the, the details is on our, our homepage. You can find the, the reference there as well. So basically, the only restraints we do is uh, amino NOEs. So if we see a base pair in the amino uh, region of the nosy, we can assign that. We use those as restraints. There's nothing else as restraints. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, so I think all the other questions which we couldn't answer, uh, we maybe can uh, refer them to the, uh, let's say, open session after we close mm -hmm. the official part. And then I would like to hand over Thank you. Uh, to Bernd Drive, uh, who will introduce uh, our second speaker. Thank you, Bernd. Yeah, hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rama Murthy. Uh, Rams is actually a um, um, professor at the University of Michigan and um, uh, obtained his PhD at the IIT Kanpur, uh, where he worked on NQR together with Professor Narasimhan. And after his PhD, he moved to Japan to work as a research scientist for GEO, uh, where he collaborated together with Professor Fujiwara in Nagayama. Uh, and uh, after this period, he moved to the US and, and became a research associate in the group uh, of Stanley Opella at the University of Pennsylvania at the time. And uh, he was a, a co-author on, um, on the PySEMA experiments, which were very famous for the characterization of oriented membrane proteins. And uh, since 1996, uh, Rams is uh, a professor at the University of Michigan. And I got to know him a little bit, a little bit better because he spent his sabbatical from 2015 to 2018 uh, at the TUM in Munich uh, as a Hans Fischer senior fellow. So uh, Rams will talk about nanodisks for NMR. And uh, he's working on, on protein aggregation and membrane proteins. So I'm very much looking forward for your presentation. So the stage is yours. Well, thank you very much uh, for the lovely introduction, Ben Drive. Um, so it was a surprise to see Ben here. Um, so uh, um, I also would like to thank all organizers for this opportunity and for this lovely Zoom in our series that keep us engaged in this um, pandemic time uh, to learn biomolecular NMR spectroscopy. So today I would like to focus on some of the applications of NanoDisk um, by focusing on, let's see, can you see my slides? Yes, very good. Okay, so, um, uh, we are going to focus on the protein-protein interaction at higher resolution in a membrane environment, which is a challenging area of research. Uh, this is what we have been working on in two different biological problems. One is on understanding um, cytochrome P450 um, enzyme uh, uh, in its drug metabolism uh, um, function. And second area of research is on protein aggregation that's implicated in the amyloidosis um, and also in liquid-liquid phase separation as well. So today I would like to uh, focus on cytochrome P450 project. Um, I worked a lot uh, in collaboration with Ben Drive on protein aggregation. Sorry, Ben, I won't be able to show you uh, much of the, our collaborative results, but I will show these uh, research on protein aggregation in the next week in the Indian NMR Society Conference. So the topics for today is, um, as I said, I will, I'll show you some of our results on um, P450 interaction with its redox partners as well as with the lipid membrane. And the second area of uh, um, research is on the development of nano disks for NMR applications, as well as for any membrane proteins, particularly on single pass and double pass transmembrane proteins. 
because these proteins have a large soluble domain, they pose tremendous challenges to traditional um, structural biology techniques. And then finally, end, I'll end with polymer, synthetic polymer nanotubes that we have been developing and applying to a variety of applications. These polymers are special because they can form nano disk. They also can be used to extract membrane protein uh, directly from the cell membrane, and we can functionally reconstitute them. So what are P450s? P450s are mighty enzyme found in all living kingdoms, uh, highly ubiquitous. Um, they, are, they carry electron, uh, they have a heme as well. So they metabolize more than 70% of the drugs in the current market. They also metabolize other uh, xenobiotic compounds. One of the most chemical, common chemical reaction is oxidation uh, catalyzed by P450 where um, P450 inserts are catalyzed to insert um, one oxygen atom into the hydrophobic compound so that they can be uh, made more easily water soluble. So naturally we call this uh, P450s as mother nature's blowtorch um, because of their function. So shown here is a cartoon representing uh, the topology, structural foldings of the cytochrome family proteins in the case of mammalian um, uh, uh, case. So, so you have a B5 and P450 reductase called cyper. These are redox proteins providing electron to P450. In fact, the first electron can come from P450 reductase. Uh, both electrons can come directly from P450 reductase um, cyper. Or the second electron can come uh, from, uh, uh, from CPR to B5, then to P450, but depending on the type of compound, it gets metabolized. So as you see, this is a membrane anchored protein. So it's like a single pass membrane protein. They have heme in the soluble domain here for B5 and P450 and FMN in this, um, in this P450 reductase. So they pose extremely uh, um, uh, the tremendous challenges to most biophysical tools for high resolution structural studies, mainly because they have two distinct domains that differ in dynamics, the time scale of dynamics. For example, the soluble domain is um, undergoing fast motion relatively to the residues in the greasy layer of the membrane, which undergo very slow motion because of the hydrophobic environment. So because of this heterogeneity in dynamics, uh, it's very difficult to crystallize full length proteins, very difficult to study using um, cryoium or other high resolution techniques. We have been focused on uh, understanding the protein-protein interaction and protein membrane interaction at high resolution to address many different questions. For example, how do the soluble domain interact so that electron can be transferred from B5 to P450? And how do the hydrophobic compounds enter via this um, a greasy lipid membrane through the hydrophobic channel to the catalytic, do catalytic domain of P450. And what are the roles of this transmembrane domains of the individual proteins in the complex formation and um, in the enzymatic activity of P450 as well. So um, a, lo a lot of studies have been reported on the soluble domains of all of these proteins, P450, P450 reductase, B5, and uh, B5 reductase as well. So beautiful crystal structures are available out there. So they're useful. But the difficulty is that if you, uh, if you do the divide and conquer approach, uh, they don't provide the complete information on this drug metabolism by the cytochrome P450 enzymes. The reasons are um, P450 soluble domain itself interacts with the lipid membrane. And also the interaction vary with the lipid composition as well. And now we have shown that the TMTM interaction does happen. And the soluble domain interaction between the P450 as well as its, with, with its redox partners can be influenced or controlled by the lipid composition of the lipid membrane as well. And the linker region, uh, which is uh, unstructured in the case of P5, and there is a linker region in, in P450 as well that controls the mobility of the soluble domain and its interaction with the redox partner as well as with the lipid membrane. So lots and lots of uh, uh, questions are uh, outstanding and uh, these systems exhibit very rich dynamics uh, and, and very difficult to probe at high resolution. So what do I do? What do I do? Uh, what are the suitable techniques to probe this high resolution details of these challenging systems? Can we crystallize these proteins in the full length and the membrane environment? I don't think so. So far, it has been extremely difficult. What about the dynamic complex? These are uh, interacting very dynamically. 
extremely difficult to crystallize for high resolution studies. Can we use cryoium? This is a very small uh, for cryoium application. B5 is 16 chlordalton, P4PT is 56 chlordalton, and reductase is about 80 to 85 chlordalton. And with the presence of membrane and the dynamics makes it extremely hard to use uh, cryoium studies. So I'm left with uh, our mighty technique NMR, and uh, we, we apply, we develop and apply NMR methods and membrane mimetics, uh, a variety of membrane mimetics to address biological questions related to preoperative function. So um, just uh, moving uh, several uh, years of work forward, here's the high resolution structure of B5 in isotropic bicells. We, we started with mice cells. Mice cells work okay for cytochrome B5, but it's not suitable for P450. My cells, um, the detergent shift P450 to inactive state P420, which is not um, desirable. So we relied on data from bi cells. So we stuck to isotropic bi cells for solution MR. We solved the structure of the soluble domain of full length protein using solution MR. Um, shown here is a higher resolution TROSI HSQZ. And for the transmembrane domain, we did solid state NMR in the static as well as MAS conditions. Shown here is the by CMR type NMR spectrum. Here you can see the helical wheel projection giving you the span of resonances, suggesting that there is a transmembrane helix which has exhibit high, uh, large dipolar coupling and the frequency corresponding to the transmembrane uh, uh, orientation uh, with, with the helix oriented with about 15 uh, plus or minus few degree with respect to the bilayer normal. So this is, we've got the first high resolution uh, full length um, protein structure and its orientation in the membrane. We also did a lot of MAS experiments and solution of experiment to probe the dynamics of residues in the soluble domain as well as in the membrane domain as well. Uh, the results show that very fast mobility for residues in the P5 soluble domain. In the TM domain, they had to go millisecond or slower time scale of motion. And if you reduce the length of this linker region, the mobility of the soluble domain can be reduced. And if you go down to eight residue in the eight residue length in the linker region, it won't bind to uh, P450, it won't uh, transfer an electron, so it's, it's no longer active um, in, in activating P450 for its endometric activity. So, so we have this high resolution structure. We played with a lot. This is a very nice. Um, uh, nice protein for NMR development, but we wanted to look at the complex structure. So we use this uh, B5 labeled with nitrogen 15 or nitrogen 15 carbon 13 as well. And then P4P is unlabeled so that we can look at the signal from B5 and we use solution NMR spectroscopy because these complex are very weakly binding um, high micromolar um, affinity. So we probed the interacting interface using chemical shift perturbation, light broadening, and also saturation transfer didn't work well, but we pretty much relied on chemical shift perturbation and line with changes as well as mutational constraint. So finally, we have uh, this complex structure model. And if you zoom in, you can see here the electrostatic interaction between cationic residues and from P450 interacting with anionic residues in the interface from B5. And if you zoom, Further, you can see the hemes from both the proteins are uh, bridged by arginine 125 from P450, and the center to center uh, heme distance is about 20 angstrom, um, and this is dynamics, so it's average distance. So, this is the first structural model for this kind of electron tons of proteins in a membrane environment. So, this is full length obtained from full length protein, uh, protein protein complex in membrane in bi cells, but I have shown only the soluble domains here because we applied solution of spectroscopy. So, what about, this, what about the transmembrane domain? They undergo very slow motion. Naturally, we go to apply solid state and mass spectroscopy. Um, we, we determine the orientation of the helices using static solid state NMR experiments with aligned bi cells. Similar tilt for B5 as well as for P450, anywhere between 13 degree to 17 degree plus or minus several degrees. So the point here is that they are tilted with respect to the bilayer normal. So now there are two possibilities. Uh, there is a similar tilt, uh, that means they can have cross structure or they can have parallel orientation like this. So the two simplified model, we would like to understand here the TM-TM interaction, if at all there is interaction between the TM domains. So to do that, we, we started to freeze the sample and we wanted to apply magic angle sample spinning experiments. 
naturally we went to Brooker uh, in collaboration to do a DNP experiment to enhance the sensitivity as well. So uh, we know that by freezing the sample lines are going to be broader. So to overcome that, uh, we selectively label this colored residues in B5 with only single atom uh, with the carbon 13 so that we can assign the peak in most cases. And we did the carbon-carbon correlation at a magic ensemble spinning condition at 100 Kelvin. Um, so we have this reasonable resolution um, to the NMR spectrum. We are able to assign them because of the selective uh, labeling. Uh, so this assignment uh, also confirmed uh, the orientation was further confirmed based on the intermolecular cross peak between the protein and the lipid head group. So freezing doesn't change significantly this tilt of the helix. So now what we did is to take the selectively carbon-13 labeled B5 and uniformly labeled P450 from a complex and then use this CN uh, read or filtered carbon-carbon correlation experiment, something Mei Hong used uh, successfully. Uh, this is in collaboration with Brooker. Similar condition, this is on multilamellar vesicles. Um, you can see here, uh, very, very few peaks, um, unlike B5 alone case. So if, I, so if we zoom in here, I see these peaks and these peaks corresponding to this losing zipper in, in, in the B5 side. So that's, that seemed to be the interacting um, hotspot for um, B5 with P450. And uh, apparently this losing zipper is also conserved among um, B5 proteins in different species. So this is, we don't have the full picture yet. We are using F19 labeled proteins. Uh, and meanwhile, we started to do MD simulation. We used my postdoc, uh, Bikar Sagu did this um, coarse grain simulation. As independent of the NMR experiments, we came up with this picture where you see this tilt of the helices also crossing similar to what we observed in NMR experiments. So this work is almost complete, but I don't have I do not have time to fully digest the data from empty simulations. We are able to get full picture of this TMTM interaction in lipid bilayer. So, so far I talked about uh, detergent uh, containing bicells. So detergent is a problem even in bicells because detergent from the rim of uh, bicells can diffuse to the lipid bilayer um, as a function of time and that would start to um, degrade P450 and shifts P450 to P420. I'll show you some example here. It is QC of this protein-protein complex between B5 and P450. At time zero, your beautiful um, spectrum. At time X, time Y, you see the red peaks start to come up and you see this consistent with the precipitation in the sample. So sample is basically gone bad, so we cannot we can no longer use the complex for NMR studies. We know NMR is a slow experiment, include, even with the use of NUS uh, approach. So we wanted to, uh, P450 is also very expensive. We wanted to completely get rid of this denaturing detergents from our sample. So naturally we went with the nano disk approach, uh, thanks to Gerard Wagner in Harvard. At the time, Franz Hagen helped us um, to give us a jump start on this uh, MSP protein based nano disk. We were able to reconstitute single protein at a time and do NMR. This is unpublished data in collaboration with Franz Hagen and uh, Wagner, but we couldn't form a complex and reconstitute them in this MSP nanodisc. We tried for quite a bit of uh, time and we gave up. And then, um, so this is very similar to the uh, sushi here. You have belt and you have lipids and protein inside the uh, in nano disk. So uh, uh, we gave up MSP for protein-protein complex and for structural interaction studies. Then we came up with this idea that if, what about if you use short peptides to self-assemble uh, along with the lipids to form lipid nano disk? They are flexible so that we can accommodate protein-protein complex inside the lipid bilayer in nano disk. So my graduate students, uh, Ray and Meng, started this project using uh, peptide nano disk through and the Carlo postdocs expanded that to uh, very different applications as well. So here is shown here is the peptide nanodisc uh, similar to protein, but you have many peptides self-assemble, uh, uh, peptides are forming the belt and you got planar, planar lipid bilayers. So we also started to do the polymer um, nanodisc, which is similar to the peptide nanodisc. Many polymers come to self-assemble to form nanodisc here. So let me go through the peptide nanodisc. Um, these are, um, 
uh, you can see you have two different peptide nanodes. They can collide in real time. They can exchange the contents in the lipid nanodes so that um, they can reach an equilibrium. For example, if you reconstruct a nanodes uh, with a protein and in another nanodes, no uh, protein but lots of lipids, the protein can select the lipids of its liking and, 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 and can, can uh, stabilize its fold and structure as a function of time. So there's lots of advantages of this flexible um, peptide peptide nano disc, uh, and we have successfully applied to study uh, B5, P450 structural interactions using NMR um, as well as top flow kinetics. And um, uh, LK coming from Ben Rice group and Mung, um, they together worked on FMN domain of P450 reductase. That's a minimum. Uh, a uh, minimum domain that can uh, be functional in providing electron to P450. So we started to probe this FMN uh, uh, domain interaction with P450. Now we have done the full length CPR as well. We're able to reconstruct full length CPR in nanodisc and see the electron transfer to P450 uh, in nanodisc. So I'll show you quickly these peptide based nanodisc um, uh, studies. We reconstitute B5 or, or CPR or FMN with P450 in peptide nano disc, and we monitor using DLS, dynamic light scattering, to get an idea of the size. And we go through the size exclusion chromatography to get this uh, protein containing nano disc sometimes, or we can also get an idea about the size of these particles. And we can also characterize using SACs. You can see um, with your naked eye, there is a belt, there is a protein complex inside. We can also do electron transfer using star flow kinetics, and we can do NMR and solve the structure as well, if, if, it is, if you can get high resolution NMR spectra. So that, that's pretty much standardized now for um, these proteins. It took a long time uh, to be able to get the uh, interacting interface by very simple, well-established NMR techniques. So shown here is the interacting interface mapped onto P450 for B5 on the left side, left side and the P450 is on the right side. You see here the significant overlap um, for both the redox partners on uh, binding to P450. So they do compete uh, uh, for interaction with the P450. This is why uh, B5 is known to either assist the function of P450 or can retard it or doesn't do anything. Depend, all it depends on the type of drug or substrate tries to get metabolized. So to better understand this competitive binding uh, uh, between P450 and its redox partners, we started to uh, look at the uh, ternary complex in nanodisc. My student, uh, Katie Gendry, uh, looked at this interaction between B5 P450 in the presence of uh, reductase and vice versa. Uh, we have all the results published in ChemComs. Um, so a lot more to be done here, so I won't talk about this. Uh, if you have questions, you can, you can look at this um, publication or we can talk about it in the Q&A session. So uh, we simultaneously, six years ago, we started when Thiru joined the lab, uh, we, he, started, he wanted to look at um, polymers, synthetic polymers as well, uh, side by side with peptide nanodisc, because the concept is very similar. Many polymers self-assemble with the lipids to form um, lipid nanodisc. So there are commercially available styrene malic acid polymer. They self-assemble to form nanodisc, shown by uh, Michael Wawad uh, Tim Daffon, um, Killian, and uh, Sandra Keller, uh, Gary Lorgan, uh, my friend Miami University, he gave us jump start on his, with his results using NMR spectroscopy. These SMA polymers uh, are commercially available from isotropic nanodisc. So they are extremely useful to extract proteins uh, from uh, membrane uh, directly without use of detergent. And we can reconstruct them functionally in many cases. But there are uh, some disadvantages. Um, for example, if you want to uh, vary the size of this SMA-based nanodisc, that's difficult. In a, that was difficult for us when we started with SMA polymer because we wanted to go large size nanodisc for solid state on our application. That wasn't possible to us. We were able to go up to even 10 to 15-ish nanometer diameter um, isotropic nanodisc, but we could not get anisotropic nanodisc for solid state NMR application at the time. And, and then they're also uh, very poor in pH um, stability. They do exhibit um, a highly unstable nature in the presence of divalent metal ions. You can see here a couple of millimolar concentration of divalent metal ions precipitate these nanodisc, these polymers. 
So Thiru, along with the guy's student, uh, Thiru started this project uh, to modify the synthetic polymer here, starting from a small size, small molecular weight SMA polymer, uh, and then later on was expanded by Nate and uh, Giacomo for various applications. So here's an example. We started with uh, 1.6 kilodalton. We started to functionalize with ethanol amine here, um, and we we're able to show this new polymer, which is two to three kilodalton, or maybe three kilodalton molecular weight. It can dissolve the membrane uh, based on the static light scattering, based on turf images, and based on um, um, based on uh, lipid to polymer ratio. We can control the size of the nano disc, right? Um, more concentration of polymer would make it a smaller size. And so this means that by changing the lipid to polymer ratio, we either we can form small size nanodisc or very large um, macro nanodisc. We can go up to even 60 nanometer diameter. Um, so that's, that's a lot of applications that can be enabled because of the large nanodisc can uh, accommodate large proteins. Um, we can also accommodate protein-protein complexes. So we can also see the solubilization of uh, multilamar vesicles or LUVs uh, with, by this polymer. If you increase the concentration of the polymer, you can see this isotopic chemical shift from P31 MR experiments coming up because small nanodisc tumble fast enough to give you the signal. Okay, so these are good, but the problem is still you have carboxyl group and they can bind with metal ion. So they're not that stable against divalent metal ions. And they're also not stable against uh, pH. So we started to modify, further modify this um, malic acid group uh, to make it found the pH independent and, and divalent ion and uh, tolerant uh, polymer. We came up with this, uh, quaternary ammonium uh, group containing positively charged uh, SMAQA polymer, which is pH resistant. Uh, of course, very low pH would degrade the lipids um, and polymer as well. So anywhere from two-ish to 10-ish pH is quite broad, um, pH range is quite stable, as well as for divalent metal ion, it exhibit quite stability here, up to 200 mill millimolar. We can also vary the constant, uh, vary the size of the nanodisc from 10 nanometer diameter to 30 nanometer diameter. Um, it's beautiful, of course, TEM is TEM, right? So it's, here's a, a, a real-time AFM showing the solubilization of uh, SMA, uh, uh, solubilization of lipid aggregates by SMA QA polymer. Okay, so we can form small size nanodisks. They tumble fast enough to give you the isotopic NMR parameters, or we can align them forming very large size uh, nanodisks. Uh, they have magnetic susceptibility. They can, they can align spontaneously just like by cells. So if you do isotropic um, uh, small size nanodisk, similar to isotopic by cells, we can do NMR probing, solution NMR probing this soluble domain. And we can do large size nanodisc or large size bicells. We can do solid stage NMR uh, to, to look at the residues in the greasy layer of the membrane. So here is HSQC, towards HSQC, uh, similar to what we have seen in bicells. And here is a Pysema type helical wheel projection. Gives you a nice spectrum, very similar to what we have seen in bicells. These are very different samples. Nanodisc samples are more greasy, more viscous. Um, we do have peaks in the uh, coming from soluble domain if you go down the nice level. So we do see that as well. Okay, so these uh, nanodisc are uh, quite stable. We have seen up to even five days inside the magnet, outside the magnet, even stable up to a uh, month. Always you can make it unstable. That's a different story, but these are quite stable. So what else we can do? We have this um, alignment medium, uh, different types of alignment medium, either positively charged uh, polymers or negatively charged polymers. So we know that this popular RDCs can be measured using alignment medium. You can use a phage or bicells. Similar, we can use, um, uh, similar to bicells, we can use nanodisc as well. So we use large nanodisc, uh, as here, larger than 20 nanometer diameter uh, to form aligned nanodisc in the magnetic field. Higher the magnetic field, um, more stability, more alignment here, shown by this deuterium NMR um, experiment here. Um, and uh, also by uh, this IPAP experiment, HSQC IPAP, in phase anti phase experiments can provide you G plus minus dipolar coupling. So we can extract the residual dipolar coupling from a protein. Uh, in the soluble, uh, in, the, in the water layer, which is shown here is for nitrogen 15 labeled cytochrome C, which is 
which doesn't interact with the lipid bilayer unless the residue of bilayer contains cardiolipin. So we're able to extract RDCs for cytochrome C and we can correlate with the calculated one and we can, uh, we can, we can, um, we can, we are able to say which structure, there are many structures that are available out there, which structure is uh, correct and which structure is wrong for the reported structure using RDCs. <clears throat> okay, so what else we can do with this alignment mediums? We thought about RQCs. If you can do RDCs, we can do residual quadruple couplings as well, right? So O17 um, is a naturally uh, nice uh, isotope. We can think about O17 and MR as a quadruple nucleus, spin five half. Um, six energy levels, so five transitions are possible, but the downside is very poorly abundant. Um, gamma is very low as well, so very sensitivity is very poor. Lots of people have pioneered this world 17 NMR spectroscopy, starting from Old Field and then uh, Griffin's group or Gang Wu's group. Um, recently, Mike, uh, Malcolm Levitt uh, done a fantastic work on world 17 NMR of water uh, molecules in buckyballs, um, liquid crystalline matrix. Um, um, he was able to see all the five transitions uh, in the corpal nucleus of spin five half. And Griesinger looked at uh, using O17 um, to determine the viscosity of the sample, I think. So uh, we started to look at this nano disk because nano disk would align. The idea was that we can, uh, we can look at the bound water um, oxygen 17 residual corpal coupling, which is an exchange with the bulk water in the nano disk sample. We can also do it for biceps as well. We have data for that. So here, uh, the, the, the RQC depends on the lipid concentration, what you have in your sample. Higher the concentration, going from 10 to 30 weight per volume, you can see a uh, larger magnitude for RQC we can observe. We can also see the residual corpal coupling becoming visible above the phase transition temperature of the lipids in the nano disk. Below that, they're isotropic. Okay, so we were able to measure the T1 for all the five um, transitions, central transition and both uh, four satellite transitions as well. So, but the downside is this natural abundant was 17 NMR. It needs tens of thousands of scans. It's a bit time consuming. So we can do with a perpendicular orientation for this nano disk, we can do nitrogen 14 NMR, we can do P31 NMR, we can do O17 at higher concentration of lipids at lower concentration of lipids. We can also add um, paramagnetic salt like ytterbium chloride, which would uh, change the susceptibility so that it can flip the bisol, flip the bisols or nano disk to parallel orientation with respect to the bilayer normal and the quadruple coupling for nitrogen 14 becomes double and uh, P31 also uh, behaves uh, according to the second order polynomial, three cosine square minus theta, but O17 also, uh, RQC increases, but doesn't double because O17 comes from water, which is not part of the lipid matrix. And to, do, to better understand this, we need to think about the emotional averaging of uh, um, water RQC and its orientation uh, with respect to the magnetic field also uh, matters here. So more averaging for perpendicular orientation than uh, parallel orientation of nano disk. That's why we see larger quadruple coupling for O17, the parallel orientation than the perpendicular orientation. So we're able to get some kind of information on the O17 exchange between bulk water and bound water in nano disk. The most importantly, we're able to once again confirm the alignment of this nano disk in the prismatic field and the flip of the nano disk when you add paramagnetic salt using different approaches. So here is a, a, a time average of three cosine square theta minus one showing the uh, higher magnitude averaging for a perpendicular orientation than parallel orientation of the bilayer um, coming from MD simulations. So what else we can do? I'm, I think I'm running out of time. I'll be very quick. Uh, we, we also use this polymers to directly extract membrane proteins shown here is for cytochrome B5 from E. coli. We can get uh, pure B5 along with the lipids. This is a beauty. So we can functionally reconstruct this protein along with the native lipids. So we can characterize using p 3 as a uh, PG lipid, the cardiolipin, PE lipid as well is consistent with the synthetic lipid uh, by layer. Now we can characterize an E. coli lipid um, containing nano disk. We can also do HSQZ here. We can also characterize with uh, um, DLS as well. 
We can also extract, uh, we have been ex uh, doing for, uh, applying for other proteins. We have done in collaboration with Randy Stockbridge, my colleague here, guanidine uh, uh, transporter, which is um, uh, intrinsic transmembrane protein, we're able to uh, um, extract and uh, reconstitute in nanodisc. We're able to collaborate with the Raxdale um, on heme oxygenase and uh, reconstitute them as well. So more work need to be done here. These are preliminary data. Uh, let's see what I have. Uh, so uh, Ben Drive, uh, my host here. So I wanted to show something. Uh, I don't want to disappoint Ben Drive. Thanks to Hans uh, Fisher Fellowship. It allowed me to interact with Ben Drive and the colleagues of uh, Franz Hagen in Munich. Uh, we did some beautiful work on trapping the intermediate of human islet amyloid peptide in MSP nanodisc. Uh, and we solved the uh, high resolution uh, structural model. Uh, this is one unit of the oligomer trapped in a lipid bilayer containing MSP nanodisc. So this is the first um, intermediate structure for such amyloid peptides. So I will talk about this more amyloid aggregation and use of polymers and polymer nanodisc in the next week in Zoom seminars. So with that, I would like to acknowledge all the people who did a fantastic work in my lab. Uh, shown here, right now my group is very small, all the blue colored uh, names right now. Uh, Thiru did all the work on uh, uh, functionalizing uh, most of the polymers um, and nanodisc and uh, related work. And Krishna did uh, direct extraction of membrane protein from lipid bio, from membrane. Nirupama did uh, some of the oligomeric uh, studies on P450. And here are folks who worked on nanodisc and uh, solid state NMR and others. And all my collaborators, including Waskal, Sangchol, Anantaramaya, um, Steve Ragsdale, uh, Randy Stagbridge, uh, Ben Rife and Franz Hagen, Toshio Ando, Nakayama, Correra, and so on and so forth. And thanks for the funding support. And thank you very much. I'll take questions. Okay, thanks Rams for this very exciting talk. Uh, I would like to ask all uh, the all audience to, to please uh, type the questions into, into the uh, questions and answers uh, um, fields. So we already have like three questions there. And uh, Constantine Minev uh, asks, what, what kind of um, bi cells do you use for solution state NMR studies? Um, we, yeah, I can answer that. So we used a very simple bi cells to start with, DMPC, DHPC. We also did a POPC combinations. I don't remember exactly now. You can look at uh, publications to, uh, by Yamamoto in Langmore. But for mainly for cytochrome project, we did DMPC, DHPC. That's, those are the simple biases that we used. Okay, so Thomas Schmidt has another question and, and he asked, what is the lowest maximum size limits uh, you can reach with the polymers for a stable sample? A very good question. So it depends on um, type of polymer that we are using. So we designed a uh, polymer, we published a paper in small journal, uh, these are, um, styrene free polymer. It's a one of the uh, polymer that's containing hexyl group as a hydrophobic moiety. Uh, we, can, we can use that from a smaller size, I think six to eight nanometer diameter, but these are all the sizes coming from DLS, TEM, size exclusion chromatography, and, and there's a lot of errors in that. So that is the smallest dimension uh, for an analysis that we can get. Otherwise, 10 is quite standard and we can go all the way up to 60 nanometer diameter. Okay, Fred Dumberger has a question concerning the helix-helix interactions. Have you done experiments to look at the interactions of the transmembrane helices of cytochrome P5 and P450 alone in bilayers? And how does the presence of the soluble domains impact the, on the interaction? Oh, you mean the TM domains alone? So we don't, I don't believe in this divide and Conquer approach. Uh, I don't want, I want to be more like a holistic um, full length protein. The reason is we clear the uh, soluble domains uh, that provide the major interacting energy, free energy for this interaction uh, through electrostatic interaction. Uh, we think uh, the TMTM -TM interaction is a weak interaction, but it's very important for structural folding inside the lipid bilayer. So if I clear the transmembrane domain, the problem is the tilt would change. We did some experiment for B5 alone for the transmembrane domain. There's a proline at the center of the helix. So the top portion of the helix would lose the helical structure. 
for the TM fragment alone. So, so we stopped doing the TM TM fragments alone. So we, I don't believe in any research that comes from TM TM domains alone. So excellent questions, uh, and we didn't have much success with that. I have a related question in this context. Yep. Okay. Uh, is, is there anything known? Are there any modulators or regulators known that that have, or that in, interfere with the transmembrane uh, helix interaction, so, so that you can? Very good question. So we are, we we I don't have data, but we, I, we do have data that if you vary the lipid composition, let's say if you put in more anionic lipids, uh, it start to um, interact with the cationic residues in the p450 soluble domain that would affect the protein protein interaction between p450 and redox partners that would also change the spin state of p450 so it's quite complex so lipid composition alone can modulate the protein protein interaction but that said i don't know the tm tm interaction can be modulated with the lipid by their composition or not because what i have shown is only um, the data what we have it takes uh, quite a lot of time and a lot of experiment to probe the TMTM -TM interaction. But now we have uh, done MD simulations. We could vary the lipid composition. We could also modulate uh, using substrate and drugs. We could modulate the binding between the proteins as well and with the membrane. So mm -hmm. this is an excellent question. More data uh, should be forthcoming in the coming years. If I so, can survive. In the and, uh, Rams, I have a related question. Yep. To yep. What was, oh, I would imagine that the, if you just take the B5 by itself or P450 by itself, the TM helices orientation might be noticeably different from when you have a complex. Have you seen that? Are you, is your PySEMA experiment able to distinguish perhaps five or 10 degree kind of orientation difference? Very, very good question. So we did the B5 transmembrane domain uh, PySEMA type experiment to, to determine the orientation of the helix. We published uh, long time ago, the, t the helical tilt doesn't change significantly within the x layer. layer. So your x layer is really large, uh, right? So um, the helix tilt is the same based on the pi sigma type experiments. We can also do HD exchange as well. It doesn't change significantly for B5. So. That's interesting. But we, could, we could use that uh, experiment to screen condition for the factors that can influence uh, tilt of the helices in the bio layer. Soluble domains are so large that when you have a complex, right, it might you know kick the the TM to be more tilted so that these top part won't uh, run into each other. <laughs> so, yeah. Also, the, there is also um, we see the salt bridge between the soluble domain of P450 with the residue in the transmembrane domain of P450 as well. So that's one way P450 can also dip deeper into the hydrophobic uh, core of the bilayer membrane. That may be a way to open up its hydrophobic channel to get the drugs into the catalytic domain. It's still a hypothesis. Okay. Mm -hmm. Justin had a question related. Uh, 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 just in the extension of that, I mean, probably a very naive question. If the two transmembrane helices are not there and the two uh, proteins, the P450 and the cytochrome uh, B B5, uh, are just working in solution, they would not work. They would not catalyze anything. You need the transmembrane helices, right? Um, you would definitely need the transmembrane. I mean, the domain, uh, uh, I know a lot of people uh, are working with only soluble domain. They get beautiful data uh, and high resolution crystallography. Steve Slager did a fantastic job on this membrane bound proteins. So I'll show you some of the data. Here is a, here is a P450 oriented um, membrane data. Uh, here is the data on MAS experiments on the alanine labeled one. So coming to, uh, let's see, we have Christian's question. So without membrane, uh, P450 reductase and P450, they oligomerize, they interact non-specifically. We don't see electron transfer occurring here. In the nano disk, we see beautiful electron transfer happening. Uh, this is the data obtained from stop flow experiment, which is also true for FM and domain alone um, with P450. Okay, uh, if if I may, I mean there there are many there are many P four hundred fifties with uh, two letters and 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 a number. I think do they all work the same way, or is there? Uh, I mean, or which one actually are you working um, on? Because I mean, there are so many, and so so. Uh, exactly. Sorry, I did not tell I did not tell the details about that. It's a very good question. So we are working on Rabbit two B four P four fifty two B four. 
We are also working on a human three year four, three year five. Um, we also work a little bit on 2D6, 2C9. I also forgot the numbers. So we do have yeah, several of those. And do they all work similarly? I don't know. Three or four, three or five, we are getting the data. So I, I don't have sufficient data to save for high resolution studies, but lots of people have done it with, with the low resolution um, uh, studies in membrane like Steve Sliger did a fantastic job on um, probing 2B4, 3A4, 3A5, a lot more proteins. But he has published a lot of work on that. Okay, so maybe we get back to the Q&A um, because yeah. Stephen Meredith has a, again, related question concerning the transmembrane helices. Have you tried to crosslink them? And if yes, uh, what changes does this produce in the solid state and the mass spectra? This is a very, very nice question, fantastic one. Uh, we thought about this uh, cross-linking the soluble domain um, because the interacting interface is very large in the soluble domain. People have done um, cross-linking and looking at using mass spec spectroscopy, but we don't want to do that because this is very dynamic complex. So the dynamics is lost here. Um, so it may be, it may, may be the V5 interacting preferability is spanning around the surface, so it's not necessarily hitting the same area all the time. So what we see is an average information in NMR data, but this is a very nice idea. We would like to try at least cross-linking the TM domains. We have not done that. Um, we would like to cross-link and co-express and directly pull the complex using our polymer. These are all in the list of things to do. Very nice question. Uh, Moreno Lely asks if it's possible to tune the size of the nanodisc. In which yes. concentration can you can be used to avoid that they collapse? What is the maximum concentration? Uh, that's a very difficult question to answer. The second part, first part, yes, we can vary the size by simply varying the lipid to polymer ratio or lipid to peptide ratio. Um, the stability depends on uh, the larger the size. I won't say small of the, I mean, weak at the stability. We've seen up to 60 nanometer diameter. I, I, I don't remember. I think with proteins inside, a large size nanodisc can be stable for even longer period of time. But the empty nanodisc alone, if you prepare, let's say 80 nanometer diameter, empty nanodisc alone is going to be uh, exhibiting poor stability because planar bilayer alone cannot be, it's going to fragment Remember, these are colliding and, and exchanging and, and uh, fusing as well. So stability can be a problem for empty nanodisc, but with the large protein complexes, you can make it more stable. Okay. Um, you talked only briefly about peptide nanodisks. And yep. uh, you also asked, uh, uh, can the peptide nanodisk alter the structure and dynamics of the protein? And what about the sample stability? Does the strategy work in absence of a long link as example. So let's, let's, let's talk about this uh, peptide belt being a um, problem for the protein and its stability and so on. This is a problem. Nanodisc belt can be a big problem for reconstituting the protein inside the nanodisc. That's why we as it could be one of the reasons why we could not uh, succeed in uh, trapping the complex inside the MSP nanodisc. Uh, we also see this a problem in a beta um, intermediate uh, when the MSP nanodisc belt plays a role in the direct interaction with the protein inside. So for peptides, we don't see a big problem because we see the function based on stop flow. Stability seems to be okay. Um, but, you know, stability goes bad beyond a couple of weeks, right? We sent sample to Yokohama Riken. Toshi Yamazaki did some experiments on our FBD. So we could record after even two to three weeks. It's okay. Dongun Lee did some experiment for us uh, in Kentucky. Um, I think the sample went bad after a month or so. So stability can be a problem after a month, at least based on the data. Mm -hmm. So Konstantin Minev asks another question. Is it possible to make smalls that are smaller than 10 nanometers? Yeah, so it's possible to. So this is size, is, size, size is a problem. Size we are saying for based on DLS data, TEM data, size exclusion chromatography. Still, you know, there is a lot of uh, error in it, right? So if I say 10 nanometer, 10 plus minus 2 or 3 nanometer. So 10 is possible within that error range. 
So, and, uh, so, Bernd, I, I think uh, we should slowly close the official part. And uh, thank so, you all for these fantastic questions. I, I feel happy that we have been tracked with a lot of people. I don't want to cut off the question, so but I just want to close the official part and thank again uh, Katya and Rams for uh, brilliant talks. But if you haven't answered any of the questions, please stay on and raise your hand. Then we unmute you and you can directly place your question uh, to the speaker. Yeah, so thank you again for joining today. And next week we will have Kevin Gardner speaking about high pressure NMR and Jennifer Matthews with excellent uh, and exciting EPR uh, work. Thank you so much.